Coming up, the New York football giants and the NFL at large are steamrolling towards the NFL draft. We update Drew Locke's interesting contract structure. We take a look inside the big boards and whether or not the big blue offensive line room is an area that Joe Shane should not be allowed to fix. We go ahead and dive in coming up next. Ah, yes, my friend, it's OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where you know that we are your host over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz. We're healthy, we're wealthy, we're wise, and as I say, fast, fastly approaching the NFL draft from, from what feels like a second ago, Andy, trying to look out into the future of what would be at the draft. Now we're inside of two weeks, now everyone is buttoning themselves up, now we know, obviously, clearly, exactly what the Giants are going to do with the sixth overall pick. Yeah, it's 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 as clear as day. If if you read it, it's it's they like Drake May, maybe maybe they like Jaden Daniels more, maybe they're going to take JJ McCarthy. That's right. Um they, they they love all the wide receivers, maybe they'll tra- So yes, it's clear as day exactly what the pick um is going to be. Adam, uh small little note, sure. since we've talked about Roma Dunze being the number one pick, uh, n- the the number one priority for the Giants at the 6th pick, he has moved uh in the betting odds from being almost tied with a lot of other people to the clear-cut second favorite, and his odds continue to trend up right next to Malik Neighbors. Every sign from the betters is pointing to Roma Dunze being the next likely if it's not Malik Neighbors at this point. Obviously, FanDuel, all the big outlets, they listen, they follow, they track OGP, and they go ahead and they set the market accordingly. A little over two weeks, by the way. I said within two weeks. I'm just a little bit giddy, but we're right there. We're on the edge of it, so don't don't hold that against me. Um, No, we mentioned there, too, what what is going to happen with this team? So there's some interesting stuff going on here before we even get into Drew Locke, which on the one hand, I want to ask you if you find it, you know, almost alarming in an indication way as to what could happen this season, or is it just kind of giving Drew Locke an opportunity to make a couple extra bucks should things go a particular way? Art Stapleton, who I actually think for the most part this offseason, we've really liked a lot of his perspectives and a lot of his opinions, but now he's kind of come around here and is offering what feels like one of those prisoner of the moments kind of perspectives when it comes to what the Giants need, should, or must do with the sixth overall pick relative to what other teams may want. Yeah, it seems like it's picking up steam and traction um, with Giant fans and, and beat writers alike. There's, you know, and Art seems to be one of, one of them that has been more vocal about it. He says that one thing that the team cannot do is trade out of the sixth pick with another team who wants to come up and get their quarterback of the future. And he, you know, he, at, on, on its face, I kind of was very puzzled by the, by the notion of, of doing that um, or, or saying that even. And the idea is you stay at that position. You have to get a, a premium area of need. Mm-hmm. If you, if you recognize you like the quarterback, you have to take them. You cannot trade with another team. I think you and I both kind of were a little puzzled by this. Like, Shouldn't just every option be on the table, Adam? Well, just, yeah, because again, so, I mean, you can think about it one of two ways. Okay, maybe you're talking about one, two, three. It goes Williams, May, Daniels. And then we're saying, okay, so it's going to be J.J. McCarthy. Is that final quarterback there at the sixth overall spot? And some team, Minnesota maybe, maybe it's Denver, right? Someone wants to come up. And so in that premise, which I think would be, maybe the least likely where you'd say, oh, you have to you have to make this decision about this quarterback. Say, well, the top three guys are off the board. So now we're talking about the fourth ranked quarterback, regardless, and we're going to talk about J.J. McCarthy a little bit more at the back end of the episode. But regardless, now we have to take J.J. McCarthy rather than allow another team come up to get him. That seems odd. The other way that it would be, and I think this is where to art points or to art's point or anyone's. Well, what if J? What if Daniels is there, right? Or what if for some reason May ends up falling there? And it feels like by perception, they've been ranked higher. They've been well-regarded, their pro days, all this stuff. So you'd be potentially missing out on your franchise quarterback. But if the premise is based on what another team thinks about a prospect, we need to decide if we're going to draft them or not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether or not they turn out to be all pros or otherwise. How could you possibly, if you're Joe Shane and the Giants, be making decisions based on what other people's draft boards are? Like, if you don't think... If you don't think that that Jaden Daniels is a franchise quarterback, but you're there at six and he's there and the Vikings call and say they want to trade up with you, 
you're going to say, sorry, we have to stay at six and take Jaden Daniels because you think that he's a franchise quarterback. It would, it just seems illogical to not have the conviction on what your board looks like and whether or not you think it's worth it. Well, in addition to that, the other, the other angle on it is the giants have Jaden Daniels, Drake may JJ McCarthy ranked super high right. and they fall to them at six. And Joe Shane says, I know this is a generational type quarterback. That's going to be a, a, a pro bowler for the next 15 years, but I could really use an extra pick at number 23. So let's pass on this guy in order to get an extra draft pick. Like that's not going to happen. So the, I, I don't really understand the scenario where the giants are trading out and being like, man, we're giving up on the generational talent that we really wanted. That was there for us. It just seems like it's uh, the only way the giants trade out is if they say we can get comparable value, say it's Minnesota who gives you the 11th pick and the 23rd pick in the draft. Adam, you, you've mentioned it before. If you're looking at a cornerback, if you're looking at, uh, you know, the next tier of wide, wide receivers, if you're looking at a, a completely different position, maybe you can recoup some draft capital, still get one of the guys that you want and get value out of someone that really wants J.J. McCarthy or Bo, you know, Bo Nix or Michael Penix Jr. or whoever it's going to be. Yeah, it's funny, too, because we've talked about we mentioned this, I think, last episode as well, that we, we don't talk a, a lot about Mitchell there, right? Cornerback out of cornerback uh, coming out of Toledo. We don't talk about Arnold out of Alabama, these positions, because we're not sitting here saying that at six overall, the Giants are going to make the decision for a position of high need at cornerback that they're going to go with one of those players. But in the trade down scenario, then all of a sudden it does open up your draft board in a different way. You start talking about maybe the cornerback position. Maybe you start talking about edge rusher based on where the talent is and best player available and maybe having multiple first round picks, even though we would expect that the Giants have to send some other capital back Minnesota's way based on you know value charts. And then you also think about if we traded out of that, what happened above us? Did we choose actively to move away from Roma Dunze or from the league neighbors to the six overall spot? Is that still a high priority? And how do we feel about a, a player like Brian Thomas Jr., right? Are we saying, well, maybe the gap between the top of the wide receiver board and the back of that first round, Mitchell as well there out of Texas, right? Maybe this gap is not as far apart. And if we can get a little double dip here, and get ourselves a cornerback and a wide receiver in the first round. You can think back to when they were able to do that, obviously, in the year with Daniel Jones and also Dexter Lawrence, though only one half of that operation seems to have come to fruition. Like Those are the things that you are battling with. And, and that's the one part in terms of this discussion that I, I, I find fascinating. It's you. We can sit here and say that the top of the draft board is clearly where the best talent lives. We love Roma Dunze. We would like nothing. If they take him at six, we would be ecstatic. But organizationally, you are having the conversations, whether it's between what's the wide receiver room here and what is it going to be at the end of the first round, top of the second round, third round, right? Now, corner, quarterback is obviously different from a perception standpoint, but you're always doing that checks and balances. How do we get from point A to point B of filling holes on our team, making our roster better and not overshooting and, and overreaching, as we know this organization, it seems to have done years ago with Daniel Jones at six and having such a strong conviction that they couldn't walk away from it, which, oh, by the way, is exactly maybe what we're talking about here with you cannot afford to not take a franchise quarterback. Now, we know the perception of Daniel Jones was different around the rest of the league, but the Giants were so concerned about trading back and not being able to take Daniel Jones in the middle of the first round. They took him at sixth overall, and that has now been a hamstring scenario for them going forward. It. Every option should be on the table, Adam, whether it's trade out, stay and pick the player that you want, whether it's a wide receiver or quarterback or trade up. If they have enough conviction in one of these guys, too. Yeah, want, yeah, yeah. and they want yeah, to we don't agree with it, but we would say guy. do it. We'd go, go ahead and do it. It's not the way that I would per per personally do it if I was the GM, but of course I am not. I am just one of the big fans that really would like to see a Roma Dunze in blue. Coming up here in a second, we want to talk about the offensive line. There is an alarming chart out there that tells you that two things. One, the New York football giants heavily invest in their offensive line over the years. And two, they're really bad at it. So we'll dive in on that aspect of things before talking about the top of the draft and J.J. McCarthy on the back end, all coming up in just one moment. Okay, so uh, before we get to the offensive line, a little housekeeping, cleaning, well, whatever, keeping and cleaning. We're doing all kinds of stuff in the house with uh, Dan Duggan speaking about Drew Locke and his contract. So um, it's interesting because mostly because the way Duggan described this was you come back around and realize it doesn't happen very often when it comes to a one-year QB contract for a player of Drew Locke's ilk, right? Backup kind of guy, maybe a chance to get some starting reps. 
five million dollar base salary, which was reported. But then he also has three million dollars in additional incentives. It's everything from one million dollars extra for playing time. It's a quarter of a million if he plays up to 49 percent of the snaps, 50 to 59, another 250,000, 60 to 69, 250,000 and then 70 plus here. Obviously, we think about Daniel Jones and the injury concerns also performance based around 92.5 passer rating completion percentage. 15 touchdowns, 88 passer rating, over 2,000 yards passing and 88 passer rating. It goes down the line here, Andy. But as Duggan points out, like this is a unique, a unique construct for a contract that, again, what increases it by fifth by what uh, over 50 percent, 60 percent, 65 percent increase of the contract value. Do you think that this indicates anything in terms of how they feel about Daniel Jones's health and what his role will be, or? Is this how you maybe get Drew Locke in the door at a slightly, even though we talked about, was it too much to spend on him? Well, you put these incentives in there and you say, hey, you can end up earning real money here. And Drew Locke looks a year ago, sees Tyrod Taylor, right? Sees DeVito getting reps and thinks, I, I probably have a good shot to earn some real money here for myself. Yeah, listen, I'm surprised that it, it took this long to come out with the incentives. Usually agents yeah. of the player want to make sure that the highest number gets reported right, right away. We have not heard about any of these incentives. It doesn't really concern me all that much. And this is the way I want my backup quarterback structured if I'm Joe Shane. It's like, in case of emergency, we pull the alarm. If you get a lot of snaps, we're going to give you more money. If you play yeah. well in those snaps, we're going to give you more money. All of that makes sense. If Drew Locke ends up playing 50% of the snaps for the Giants this year and gets a couple million extra as a result, he should get that because right. a backup quarterback is there for the emergency one or two starts. Make sure you can keep your season afloat. If he's playing half the games, he is definitely outplaying or out snapping what his $5 million contract originally states. Yeah, and you and I, I think we talked about this going back to it, where it's like if you were a players of a certain caliber, you kind of don't hate the idea of this model. It's like put it, you know, put it all, put it all in the contract. If I throw for X, if I run for Y, if I catch X number of balls, if you're a wide receiver, right? Like this to me would be like a good Darius Slayton model. If he was coming up and he looks at his numbers and kind of knows where he tracks, like, hey man, give me a little incentive laden contract here. If you are a linebacker coming in, especially into this team, you might want to say if you're a veteran free agent, hey, uh, put 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 a sack, you know, incentive in there. Why? Because uh, Kayvon Thibodeau, Brian Burns, you know, Okereke, a lot of bodies occupying Dexter Lawrence. Maybe I just kind of squeeze in there and all of a sudden I end up making myself some extra money. So I think it's a good structure for Drew Locke first and foremost. I think it's fine for the New York football giants. And to your point interesting that it took this long i wonder if this this hierarchy of daniel jones is the guy he's going to be healthy he's going to be the starter drew lock says all the right things at the press conference not that this tells you anything different but you're like oh you have to be somewhat confident that you're going to have a pretty good opportunity to hit some of these incentives if you're drew lock and his agent when you sign this deal I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. It's why Drew Locke picked it. It's one of the few pathways that he has to actual real snaps, whether it's Daniel Jones' play or, more importantly, Daniel Jones' health. It remains to be seen how the Giants decide to attack the quarterback in the draft. They, we know that they need to add one more quarterback, whether it's through free agency or the draft. It's just a matter of where they get, where they get drafted is going to indicate kind of where in the pecking order everyone stands, in, at least in my opinion. I really like the, uh, you know, the I the interesting. This is from a narrative standpoint. Daniel Jones maybe isn't ready for the start of the season. Drew Locke plays the first two games, and then because then go back and look at all the percentages and you go, oh, okay. Well, you know, now depending on what happens here, if Daniel Jones doesn't come back 100% healthy, now you're Drew Locke and you're thinking I got a real opportunity to make some hay. And hopefully, the ultimate result here is about being productive on the field, helping the team win games, and then getting some of those bonuses. Okay. The other thing that we want to get to here as well is looking at the offensive line. So Andy had tracked this one down um, when it came to total value of offensive line draft picks. So it goes uh, along the lines of percent of teams draft value spent on offensive line. It's a little axis. I'm not going to put the chart up because I forgot to put it in here. The bottom line is if you're listening over on the podcast, it wouldn't matter to you. The New York football giants are far and away up at the, what I assume they don't even mark it on the chart is the 30 five percent draft value spent on offensive line and then you talk about total value over seven thousand points the next closest team 
would be the New York Jets, 6,000 points, but doing it only spending 23% of their draft value. Next highest team to spend the most amount of draft capital would be the Tennessee Titans, but again, below 5,000 points in terms of draft value. The Giants spend a lot of capital on the offensive line, Andy. I point this out because you wouldn't realize it by watching the team on the field. Well, I think that's also been a little bit of a misnomer with the Giants that like we talk about fixing the offensive line and people assume that fixing the offensive line means they have ignored it or they have not tried to address it. And we know Joe Shane has drafted guys like Marcus McCaithen, Azudu. Yep. He, he has gone out and signed free agents like Mark Lewinsky. He went out and spent a first round draft pick on Evan Neal at right tackle. They went out and spent a high draft pick on John Michael Schmitz to shore up the center position. They have gone out and spent a ton of draft capital over the last few seasons to try and fix this. The problem is, Adam, They're while we're it. throwing a lot of draft capital and value at it, it clearly has not been helping because the offensive line was the second second most sacked in NFL history and looked like it, it was a sieve yet last season. After knowing that we've spent this much draft capital, the only thing we really have to show for it right now is a Pro Bowl potential all pro left tackle in Andrew Thomas. That that's that's the issue here. And it's funny because we speak highly of Joe Shane, as many people do. We think he has a good vision. We understand what he came into with this franchise, a lot of money, right? Bloated contracts, trying to figure things out, restructure stuff, all that, all that's great. But so far now in his tenure, he has drafted Evan Neal, he has drafted Marcus McCathan. He has drafted Joshua Zudu, and he's drafted John Michael Schmitz. And oh, by the way, the other part that we can talk about with this uh, investment of value on the offensive line and then return on that investment is when you go over and look at the expected. So here's some positive and then a little bit of negative. Per, uh, projected expectations for 2024 pass protection for the NFL season. New York football giants. 13th projected value in the league. Fantastic. Top half, 94 at left tackle. That would be Andrew Thomas. 60 at left guard. A little bit of TBD here. We're not sure with Luminor. We've got some other players in there. We have guys like Josh Azudu in the mix, certainly as well. 85 at right guard. Presumably that's going to be Runyon. And then 60 at right tackle, where we think Evan Neal at least is going to have every shot to have that role. So a little bit of a mixed bag here, obviously, but some real value there. Uh, oh, sorry. I apologize. 70 at right tackle, which is... Actually, a little bit alarming if we're talking about Evan Neal. Hey, a little bit bullish on him. Nine, Andrew. Nine. Zero nine at the center position for John Michael Schmitz, who, guess what? Even though, and this is the tricky part, everyone agreed, best center in the draft a year ago. So it's not about the perception of where the prospect is, but for better or worse, Joe Shane has invested through the draft in his tenure and has not seen the results so far. If John Michael Schmitz struggles, and I'm not, by no means is his journey written, but if he struggles coming into this year, that will be four players drafted from the first to the fourth round, and all of them will be misses. That's the troubling thing. When you continue to invest in, in, in an offensive line, it doesn't work out. You continue to have to recalibrate the following year, and then you add Glowinski into it, right? You add some of the other decisions that they made, letting players go, by the way, right? They let guys walk out the door over the last couple of seasons that could have been great stopgap players. So it's a troubling trend here that I think we're going to have a very keen eye on, especially if the Giants in the middle rounds look to bring in another developmental player in behind some of these veterans. Yeah, shout out to Computer Cowboy, who was the one that posted it Thank originally yes. uh, on X. Um, Adam, the interesting thing is the 70 is they're believing that Illuminor will be the right tackle for the Giants. They think John Runyon Jr. will be the right guard, and they have Aaron Stinney at the left guard position. Um, first of all, it's surprising to me that People, even though Joe Shane and everyone is saying in camp, Evan Neal is going to be the, the right tackle starter and we're going to have Illuminor and Runyon play okay, inside right of real quick. Why does it surprise you so much, though? Because here, here's and this is a global thing, because you, you would talk about I'm not busting your chops about this, but we talk about smoke screens and you can't take it all at face value. Well, if whatever they are talking about, assume it's what they're not talking about that is actually going to happen. So if they're sitting here telling you that, hey, Evan Neal, every opportunity he's going to come in, he's going to be the starting right tackle and they're kind of being bullish about it. Shouldn't we assume that the player that you did pay, you know, and you went through this the other day, well, Runyon and Illuminor at guard spots would make the most sense. The money's been invested. 
but shouldn't we assume that it's far more of an open competition at right tackle going into training camp than maybe they would prefer it to be, obviously because of performance? Oh, I, I completely disagree. I mean, we talked about following the money. John Ryan Jr. got three years and $30 million. We know he's starting. Right. You know, Illuminor uh, got a, a very similar deal, two-year deal for about 8 to $10 million each year, depending on, on the incentives on it. Mm -hmm. He's obviously going to be a starter. Aaron Stinney's making the veteran veteran minimum, essentially, with very little guaranteed money. Joe Shane and the team believe that their best opportunity is to be able to shore up the interior offensive line more than the right tackle position. On our last show, no, no, no. we detailed how the interior offensive line was a bigger issue than the actual tackle positions. And that's why, in my opinion, not only did they pay the money, but they're also going to put those players at the biggest area of need, which to me is that interior offensive line. I think yeah. the interior offensive line has been a bigger problem than Evan Neal. Evan Neal gets highlighted because he is on the right tackle position and was a first round pick. But man, the interior offensive line need to be fixed. It's my feeling that Joe Shane immediately wants to put his two free agent signings in the interior rather than outside. Oh, no. But by the way, though, so the, the area I don't disagree with you is, yes, Joe Shane's preference is that Evan Neal ends up being a good right tackle because I invested a top 10 pick in this player. I want him to be good. So if we're talking about expectations and preference, yes, that's what they want. We brought in Illuminor. He's going to play left guard. Runyon's going to play right guard. We're going to have Andrew Thomas at left tackle. JMS, the second year player. Okay, he struggled a bit in his rookie year. We've now surrounded him with veterans, so that should help him. And then we're going to have Evan Neal return to form here a bit. And by the way, I'll acknowledge he, just like Andrew Thomas, this is maybe the only connection you can make between these two players early in their careers, has had injury issues over the first couple of seasons. So it's not unreasonable to think to whatever level he's going to play that he has been hampered a little bit. He's had a difficult path and he has not ingratiated himself at any point with the fan base during his struggles. I think that that is the preference, but I think that it's short sighted to say, but what if he were to struggle? What would the pivot be as it stands right now? It's, it's impossible to look at what the roster construction is and say, what would they do if Evan Neal looked like he was a real mess heading into the season? They're going to still run him out there week one, or would they say our new construct is maybe going to be Andrew Thomas, whether it's Stinney, whether it's going to be a Zudu, right? Any of these players that have been there, JMS, then Runyon, and then putting Illuminor in there. And the one spot we're all, because this isn't this isn't us um, on opposite sides of this discussion, it's in the discussion. The one problem there would be, are you going to pair a lack of, of known quantity in say a Zudu or Stenny, you know, a veteran, but, but low level veteran, any player along with your rookie and continue to have these, these two points, right. Which we said over the years is always the worst part. Having that gap where you feel like, well, now left guard and center is going to be our weakest spot. And it's hard to mitigate that because you can't have this every other right. Three fifths of the line looking good and putting some insecurities in between. So Adam question for you. Answer. We're, we're in early to mid April. The draft hasn't happened yet. There's a lot of things that can change between now and week one of the NFL season. Right? That's right. But if I asked you and I said, Adam, here's a bunch of, of uh, poker chips. Here's a bunch of casino chips. You need to put it on what you think the week one starting offensive line is going to be for the, for the Giants opening game. What is the most likely scenario and how the offensive line sets up for week one? If you had to put actual money on it what do you think is the most likely lineup the giants use? yeah i mean I, I i think i think this is a it's a it's a incomplete exercise because the draft still has to come and training camp has to come right but yes like i would agree with you thomas illuminor jms runyon and neil right like that's just the premise you're First round picks start as your bookends, your two veterans that you brought in the free agency, and then your and then your second year player and your high second round pick, almost first round pick starts in the middle. hundred percent. Like I don't disagree that that is the logical spot, but that would it also precludes us from saying the logical spot would be that Evan Neal should be should have been playing to a near Pro Bowl level after two years in the league, and he hasn't. If Evan Neal was the guarantee, then there is a real world where the Giants weren't signing both Runyon and Illuminor like so I'll, I'll I'll flip that back to you if Evan Neal was a high quality right tackle in the first two years of his career are Runyon and Illuminor both being signed this offseason no I think I think probably one of them gets signed and they look into the draft to try to find a guard position but right. they've already done that with Azudu and McCathan and that hasn't worked so maybe they were like hey let's just go spend the money and actually fix this once and for all and and that kind of shows the malfeasance of this of this general manager and coaching staff 
that we have invested so heavily in the offensive line. It's been abysmal. We are far and away have invested the most draft capital. And also this offseason, two of our biggest free agent signings were also on the offensive line. We're literally throwing right. a million things at this, hoping that it gets to what? League average? That's where we're at right now. We're not even saying we're going to have the strongest offensive line. We're just saying don't be the number one reason why we don't even know if we have a franchise quarterback. A hundred percent. Now, again, to remind everybody, that's 13th ranked overall on projected pass protection. That is really solid. Now, again, the wrinkle being, is it Evan Neal you insert there at right tackle? And if you do to start the year, how would that impact the way that these projections go? Because there's just no world where you could talk about a 70 rating for a player that has struggled mightily over the start of his career. That being the case, we close out here in a second, getting right back to the top. J.J. McCarthy, this discussion at the top of the board, and some interesting things when we take a look at where Tankathon projects the Giants to go in their first three rounds. We get into that in just one moment. Okay, so we go over to Tankathon and we talk about it. We live in it. We try to figure it out. The New York Football Giants, as of right now, mock draft for Tankathon comes through. It's going to be Williams, Daniels, May, one, two, three. It's going to be Marvin Harrison Jr. at four. It's going to be Malik Neighbors at five. Now, if you're Andy and I, you say, hey, look at that. Roma Dunze fell right into our laps at six. Thank you so much. Although, I think there's discussions to be had about trade downs, about J.J. McCarthy and the perception. A very interesting discussion has been going on around him, talking about how a lot of people look at his games and say, well, the stats aren't there. But, rightfully pointed out, Michigan up big in games, J.J. McCarthy not needing to throw the ball a lot, you're not going to see some of those bigger numbers. They had a really good season, and they're, they're an offensive system that didn't require that. Now, if if the sample size was bigger, would it look worse, better, and different? We'll never know. But it's, it's a worthy note there. So the Tankathon mock, though, has the Giants taking J.J. McCarthy at sixth overall. They So no trade backs, nothing happening. When they come back around at 47, Jonathan Brooks, the running back, is the selection there. And then when they come up at 70, Xavier Leggett. Two things here. One, if you go one, two, three through these rounds and you get quarterback, running back, wide receiver, how do you feel about that in terms of the need board and maybe saying, didn't we talk about cornerback here somewhere? And also, does this does this feel realistic to you? Because Leggett has been interesting. He's kind of fluctuated up near the top of that second round. He's come down a little bit. Some other players and names at that position have overtaken him. So it, it, he's a, a fascinating study because I think he falls a little bit more on the raw talent kind of side of the spectrum for wide receivers. And you're thinking about what you can build him into as opposed to what he's ready to be week one, day one coming into the season. Yeah. So for me, I, I I suppose this is a good path. If you really like Xavier Leggett, like I understand it. I, to me, it's a little high for a running back. Like if you weren't going to pay Saquon Barkley, who is considered one of the best running backs in the league, why are you going right. to spend high draft capital to replace him? I, I don't necessarily like that path. I'd like uh, the running back to be addressed at the 70th position or back further. I think that I'd rather, as we mentioned before, uh, Kamari Lassiter, uh, cornerback, would be my second round selection over a running back. I feel like there's a lot of guys that could be um, a complement to Devin Singletary that are way further down in the draft. And so for me, I, I, I really would be more frustrated with the running back pick in the second round than I would be the quarterback pick. With that said, Adam, I just can't get it out of my head. And you may say, well, it's a sunk cost. Deal with it. And move on, Andy. That's Is, right. We're paying Daniel Jones all of this money. Doesn't make We're now, we just this. did a segment earlier this show of how we're, we guaranteed Drew Locke like the fifth or sixth most backup money in the league. Now all of a sudden we're finding out there's $3 million worth of incentives. And now we're saying we're going to draft a, a guy sixth overall. It feels like we're over overcorrecting the same way that we've done with the offensive line where it's like we're throwing all of this stuff at it and we still don't even know if we have it fixed yet. But if Joe Shane has conviction and believes that J.J. McCarthy is the future – I understand the selection. It's just not the way that I would go about it. Yeah, I mean, say, yeah, I, again, I, I don't. I, the, 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 to be to be informed about a decision at a position or anything in life based on the past decisions you've made and whether or not those were mistakes, that then you're doomed to end up making mistakes again, potentially. Daniel Jones didn't work out. You shouldn't have given him the contract. So now you're going to sit here and say, well, because we invested money in Daniel Jones, we couldn't possibly draft a, a rookie quarterback, right? And then the Drew Locke piece is big too. But again, these things aren't done in a vacuum. A year from now, it will be 
no money on the books and just a second year quarterback and whatever veteran backup you choose to bring in. So while, yes, it would occupy a lot of money now, you'd have to tell me, well, what should they have done differently or where should they have invested other money? The $8 million potentially, $5 million base for, for a player like Drew Locke, that's not what's hindering your offseason decisions. It's that you have the money occupied by Daniel Jones. It's that you're waiting on Darren Waller to decide what his future is going to be and whether or not a post-June 1 cut will happen here where you'll get $11.6 million in cap relief back, right? So I think all those things factor in. Will it be weird if the Giants take J.J. McCarthy and they have over $50 million invested in the QB position? Of course it will, because most teams in their position don't look like that. But you have to, again, just like you said at the top, we're going to make a decision about taking a quarterback or trading back or not trading back based on other teams' perceptions. We're going to not draft a quarterback at sixth overall based on the perception of how it'll look that we invested too much money. You can't afford to do that. If you believe in J.J. McCarthy, then you go ahead and you draft him there, right? You don't draft him there because you think at 11 or 12 that Minnesota or Denver are going to draft them and they're going to look really good or they're going to trade up and they're going to look really good, right? It has to be about how do you feel about the players you're scouting, about the players you're signing in free agency. You have to have conviction on it. And, and as we say here, it's hard when we look at some of the decisions that Joe Shane and the Giants have made. They haven't all been perfect, but we're, we're trusting them. In year three, we are trusting and we think that they made some smart moves this offseason already, some trades and decisions that they had. And we hope that they go ahead and apply it the smart way going forward as the draft approaches, including, by the way, uh, Josh Allen just got effectively a very similar contract to what Brian Burns signed following the trade from Carolina. So that market and that value, as we said, we asked that question. Well, it's right in that similar field. So things start to line up here. Sometimes you got to give it those couple of weeks, as we'll have to do after the draft, to marinate in whether it was good or bad. Well, at the end of the day, Adam, yeah, the J.J. Day. McCarthy might be the selection at six. And if the Giants have conviction and think he's the 10-year starter, Daniel Jones, Drew Locke should not stand in the way. No contract should stand in the way of you getting a generational quarterback. I totally yeah. agree. My my preference is the Giants should potentially use this year as, as a year to figure out what they have with the rest of the team and address the longer-term solution for a quarterback next season when you have all of that money off the books. That's just my preference. But again, as I mentioned, if J.J. McCarthy is the guy and they have him ranked higher than Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors, get the best guy and figure the rest of it out. Because as everyone else has pointed out, when you have a franchise quarterback, everything else is a lot easier. Look, I mean, there's only one Patrick Mahomes. But look, they can trade Tyreek Hill and they can win back-to-back -back Super Bowls. You look at Josh Allen up in Buffalo. They could trade Stephon Diggs because they know maybe if they replace him with someone else, Josh Allen can cover things up. A lot changes when you have a generational type quarterback, and we don't necessarily think that we have one of those on the roster right now. You better believe it, man. And and it's what the hardest part, I think, for both Andy and I in any of these discussions is that we really like Roma Dunze. So it's just hard to get away from it, even if you think we can trade back and we can double dip and we can do a lot of things. And, and that's probably something we'll continue to talk about going towards the draft that maybe we're over convicted on, on this one very specific player that's preventing us from seeing the bigger picture. So we're going to walk through mock drafts and we're going to walk through trade down and trade and eh, mostly trade down scenarios. I'm not even going to get too deep in trade up scenarios. because I just don't think it's realistic for the giants, but we'll hit those as well. And whether or not we could walk out of a draft having moved out of six one way or the other, and still feeling like we accomplished a lot for the giants and put them in a spot to be successful this year and going forward. In the meantime, friends, get over to YouTube, One Giant Podcast. Turn on the alerts so you know we're going live. Get over to X at AndyMac214, at Adam Armbrecht, at One Giant Podcast, on those podcast feeds wherever you get those needs fulfilled. And until next time, until the best times, as Andrew Makowitz would want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go big blue.